Today I'm going to talk about how to create uh, next generation digital learning environments. I'll talk about the features that make a true next generation learning environment as opposed to a management environment. And I'll talk about the theoretical underpinnings for genuine uh, digital learning environments. All of this will be in the context of university education, ranging from vocational education programmes to postgraduate programmes. Now, the interest generated by instructivist massive uh, open online courses over the last few years has finally galvanised universities into action. We have an opportunity to bring together over 20 years of experience in digital learning and teaching, informed by research and practice. New technologies, new approaches to learning and new methods of designing and developing learning can all be applied to help us create new and better possibilities for learning and teaching in higher education. I'll talk now about some of the thinking that we need to accommodate. I'll start with theories of learning. There are lots of theories about how we learn as children and as adults. Some of these have uh, long tradition based in face-to-face -face models of education and traditional print-based distance education models. Others are newer and take advantage of affordances offered by new digital technologies. In fact, there are many ways in which learning can occur in higher education and that approaches to learning are inevitably driven by d discipline, level, learner, maturity, teacher experience and a host of other factors. Modern digital learning environments need to be able to accommodate multiple approaches to learning, ranging from highly constructivist models of learning through to more social methods such as social constructivism, connectivism, rhizomatic learning or other social learning approaches. They need to also offer opportunities for maker-based pedagogies that allow for creation, sharing and curation of learning between groups of learners. If we want to build a true next generation digital learning environment, what we need to be able to do is apply these learning approaches within broader contexts. I see two, to see two complementary contexts within which learning strategies can be adopted. The first of these is the pedagogy andragogy hutagogy continuum, originally conceptualised by the Australian researchers Hayes, Stewart and, Ke and Kenyon in 2013. This can also be thought of as student-focused learning, student-centred learning and self-determined learning. Or in other words, how do we get a student to learn, how do we get a student to self-direct their learning and how do we get a student to self-determine what they want to learn and choose how to do it. Our current focus is very much on, on pedagogy, but if we want to create lifelong learners and learners that will keep coming back to us as learning partners in the future, then we need to pay much more attention to andragogy and hutagogy. Ironically, we, uh, we actually probably do more of these than we think already. We just don't observe that we do them. What we need are digital environments that would encourage us to focus on andragogy and hutagogy and not just pedagogy. The second context is in communities. When we start to talk in terms of social learning, connectivism, rhizomatic learning, creation, sharing and curation, then we inevitably start to think of social groups. This leads us to think about the communities of inquiry and communities of practice. In particular, Etienne Wenger's work uh, allows us to locate other opportunities for learning within the context of communities of practice. In his follow-up work with Nancy White and John D. Smith, uh, Wenger focuses on theories of communities of practice in what they term digital habitats. These ideas provide us with concrete examples of what a true digital learning environment might look like. For Wenger, Rice and Smith, just as natural habitat reflects the learning of the species, a digital habitat is not just a configuration of technologies, but a dynamic, mutually defining relationship that depends on the learning of the community. It reflects the practices that members have developed to take advantage of the technology available. And this experience, this technology, as a place uh, for the community. A digital habitat is first and foremost an experience of place enabled by technology. They consider all aspects of digital habitats, but I will highlight one of the key distinctions that they make. That is the distinction between the integration of habitat features as being through the platform, through interoperability, through the use of integration tools or through practice. In platform integration, the platform contains everything that is needed for the community. Tool interoperability allows us to use tools from different systems that communicate using APIs. Integration tools such as Zapier and if this then that allow us to construct integrations between tools. Finally, integration through practice relies on common practices such as naming conventions and hashtags to create linkages between tools. 
In my view, the expectation that a single platform can contain all of the functionality required uh, for a community is misguided. And whilst practice-based integrations can work well with very experienced and highly digitally literate learners, the optimal approach is to use interoperability and or integration tools to create rich habitats from distributed, from distributed tools while retaining a clear identity. The development of these sorts of digital habitats for learning should be the basis for creating genuine next generation learning environments. So if we use digital habitats as the foundation for a genuine digital learning environment, then what might that look like? What are the common features? How are they organised? I'll start by looking at the scope of digital habitats in terms of their potential distribution through an institution. Then I'll discuss some of the key design principles that we've developed over the last two years as we've created digital habitats for learning. Finally, we'll, finally I'll talk about some of the key functionality that might be included in a digital habitat. Digital habitats as environments are based on ideas about communities of practice or communities of inquiry. As such, they need to have a domain focus. This domain focus may coincide with an area of study, a discipline or a programme of study. Uh, they may be driven from within a single school or department or across several schools. For example, a school may have three digital habitats that focus on, say, property, construction and project management. Um, there may also be digital habitats where the domain is research focused, such as a creative practice research, where the learners uh, learn across several schools and programmes may, may form a, a community that way. Key feature of digital habitats is that they will often cross organisational boundaries, both internal boundaries and external boundaries. Incidentally, the ability to form relationships across internal boundaries is a key factor factor in diffusing innovations across an organisation. Crossing external boundaries is also critical. Universities are porous organisations that do not have hard edges. We have part-time students, part-time staff members. We have collaborations with other institutions, with governments and the community. We have a unique role in creating knowledge, which we do quite well, and disseminating knowledge, which in my opinion we could be much better at. All of this means that we need to provide ways and means of working, sharing and collaborating with learners both inside and outside of the institution. You can see this in the diagram. The end result is that we may well have many digital habitats that will interact with it within and between organisational units and outside of the organisation. Our systems need to be capable of managing this. This leads us on to the design principles for digital habitats. We've developed seven guiding principles for digital habitats. Above all is learner experience. Everything else falls second to this. By learner experience, I mean the ability for a learner, and by learner, I mean all users of the environment, including experts, to use the digital environment effectively, easily and enjoyably. This requires careful consideration of all interactions between a learner and the environment, including interactions with learning material and other learners. By using principles of user experience design, universal design and usability design, we should be able to create learning environments where the technology becomes seamless and just works. Then, in order of importance, I see agency first in terms of learner control. By agency, I mean the ability for a learner to act within a system. Current learning environments often restrict the ability for learners or learning facilitators to control their environment or to create um, learning objects within the environment. A next generation digital learning environment would offer much higher levels of agency to users. The next is social first in terms of learner interactions. As this does not preclude, uh, sorry, this does not preclude learning opportunities based on individual study, but it does mean that the environment will encourage social interactions both within designed learning spaces and within a wider social habitat that can be that can encourage informal social learning and the self-organizing groups encouraged by rhizomatic learning. The, envir the environment would be flexible first in terms of content. By this I mean that it would include powerful and yet simple content builders available to all users that can easily display content of all types from inside and outside, including collaboratively, collaboratively developed content. 
This does not preclude the use of templates. It merely means that templates should be used for quickly creating new content based on a design pattern rather than as a restriction on user agency. In terms of access and integration, learning environments should be open first. I strongly believe in the benefits to the institution, the subject matter expert, the learner and the wider community of open content and open environments. A next generation digital learning environment should encourage this approach. This does not mean that everything has to be open and there should be opportunities to restrict access to selected components where appropriate. With regard to integration, the next generation digital learning environment should use open standards for communicating, embedding, sharing and authenticating learners and learning objects. I also believe that these environments should be built upon open source software. As is common with any modern digital system, a next generation learning environment should take a mobile first approach in terms of delivery. That is to say it should work completely on a standards compliant modern web browser in a mobile device. Needless to say, it should render well on other devices as well. Finally, it should go without saying that any new digital learning environment should take a standards first approach in terms of its underlying technology. Now let's look at the key functionality that we need. I've split these into design spaces and informal spaces. There are several types of design space within a digital habitat. The first of these are what we might call course spaces. These are spaces that have been created within the environment that allow for structured and semi-structured learning to take place. For example, these would range from highly instructivist, set and forget, self-paced courseware with minimal expert involvement through to structured social constructivist and connectivist courses. These might be operated on a periodic course offering basis, but a far better way to do this is to provide a continuing course space around which a network can form. These ideas are best described by David Wiley and John Mott in their work on open learning. The first of these diagrams shows the effect of recreating time boxed courses on the learner network for an individual course. And the second uh, shows the cumulative effect over several semesters. This diagram overlays the cumulative effect of growing learner network. Uh, this might be for one course or for a program. The second kind of design space is a di in a digital habitat is a learner's own space. This is a space that they can control. It can be used for personal reflection, as a showcase for achievements, as a place for evidence of learning, as a central node for their personal network or as a location for assessment artifacts. The learner space may be wholly within the system or it may be an external space that is accessed through the habitat, either through embedding or linking. Regardless, the learner has full control over their learning space and the data that it contains. A lot of thinking has already been carried out regarding this type of space, particularly notable as the Domain of Wonder Shown initiative, originally developed by Jim Groom at the University of Mary Washington. This allows all students to have their own web space, including their own domain name. It assists students develop their own online identity, allows them user agency and develops digital literacy. The third kind of design space is one that aggregates artifacts relevant to the domain or discipline focus of the digital habitat. These can be generated by members of the community, by guests, or, or be external objects that are open and of high value. This sort of space grows over time and can be used to initiate discussions, thoughts, and connections. They also form a resource from which other design spaces can either contribute or extract. Needless to say, there is little point in this sort of space being closed to non-members. Um, informal spaces uh, through the habitat are primarily formed around social networking layer. This provides opportunities to, to develop a personal learning network within the habitat. It follows the common features of external social networks, including the ability to follow or friend other learners, form private or public groups around special interest, and of course, to allow for learners to communicate with each other. The social network layer within a digital habitat can, and probably should, incorporate external social networks such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, GitHub, etc. The main purposes of a digital habitat social layer lie in the opportunities for uh, the discovery of other learners and the ability to initiate collaboration through shared resources. 
There are some other important features of digital habitats that should be mentioned. These include the ability to share and curate artifacts and the ability to create and schedule both place-based events and scheduled events. Digital habitats can integrate with applications like Eventbrite and Meetup to allow for face-to-face -face events. They can also be used with scheduled webinars and video conferences. In one recent example, we included the ability to initiate a video conference via Skype or Google Hangout from any location within the habitat. Putting it all together, we get something that looks a bit like this diagram. All of this may sound great, but there are many challenges. Whilst the costs of creating underlying technical solutions for digital habitats are relatively small, the time and effort required to steward a community of practice and grow that community is not inconsiderable. Institutions need to be aware of this when they're supporting the creation and development of digital habitats. They also need to articulate the desire to create these forms of uh, environments as part of a coherent, meaningful and realistic strategy for digital learning in higher education. Reward mechanisms need to be developed that align with the strategy and support needs to be provided to learners of all types. Expert learners, subject matter experts, need to be prepared to work collegially with others in the field of digital learning. More positively, it is clearly possible to develop digital habitats that initially focus on just one aspect of the habitat, typically artifacts or learner spaces, and other features and components can be included over time. This diagram shows such an evolution. It may well be the case that digital habitats are initially focused on postgraduate education, where learners are more experienced in learning, have higher levels of intrinsic motivation, and perhaps more clearly value a network of learners. Ideally, over time, digital habitats can form a space which learners will move in and out of during their lifetime. The cross-institutional boundaries of digital habitats will encourage lifelong learning. They can also form the basis for inter-institution collaboration and for work with the wider community.